we be live. Hello. Hi. <laughs> hey, wh where's our branding? What the hell? Oh, no. Whoops. There we go. Oh, there we go. I fixed it. <laughs> okay. Good, good catch. Good, good. There's our branding. And there's your reminder you point at. To subscribe. To subscribe, subscribe, and also hit the like button, okay? There's a constant reminder right there for you all the time throughout the entire stream for you to subscribe. So we're going to be covering the news today. Um, 10 news items as usual, uh, which Susanna and Dee and the rest of the team have picked for us and done a lot of research to make sure the news is good and everything. So thank you so much to the team. That deserves a like. Please make sure you like it. It doesn't cost you anything and it helps us grow the channel. So pre please make sure you like the video. Also, also, uh, let us know where you're watching from. I think this might be the last week where we can't stream on Facebook because the Facebook people are very good at telling us where they're streaming from. But now we're gonna, hopefully by next week, we'll be back on Facebook again. Uh, yeah, that's, that's. We're doing a good. long stint in Facebook channel. Yes, yes, one month over some over stupid like we got a we got a warning on Facebook for stupid reasons. Again, I have to tell you what it was. It was a Bible verse making fun of how homophobic the Bible is, okay? And Facebook is like, oh, you're being homophobic. I'm like, no, I am making fun of homophobia. And the, the Facebook was like, no, no, you're homophobic. I was like, no. And they're like, now we're in Facebook jail for a month. And the people at of... Facebook or contacts tell us like, oh, okay, well, you just have to make sure that the caption of these kinds of memes is very clear that this is satire. It was. Blah, blah, blah. It doesn't make a difference. <laughs> the caption is like, look at this horrible, horrible homophobia. The caption was like very clear. And Facebook was like, Does it matter? You're you're the homophobic one. Right? Okay, so how does it feel to be a homophobe army? <laughs> effectively, Facebook is now becoming homophobic while trying to catch homophobia. You know why? Because People will decide, like, okay, then we can't fight homophobia because if we want to fight homophobia on Facebook, Facebook is going to think we're homophobic. So now, by Facebook making it more difficult for us to fight homophobia, Facebook is allowing homophobia. Good job. Amazing work, Facebook. God damn it. It's so stupid. <laughs> All right. Why are we kidding? Okay, I don't know. Um, with reg by the way, with regards to the first news today, I have two things that I want to show. So whenever it gets the, you know, whenever we have time, let me know. You know, it is Iran related, Iran related protest stuff. I have two banners that people are holding in the yeah, streets. Yeah, yeah, let's do that for the oh. second news. Oh, second news. Okay, okay. Yeah, and um, we are um, Iran deep dive. Okay. If you're new here, we cover Iran and what's happening in Iran very, very closely. In yes. I think more uniquely and in depth than <laughs> most other channels. Okay. Today I see we have a lot of India news as well. India related yes, news yes, and yes. bank and two two India related news I think and one Bangladesh related news, one mm -hmm. Sweden related news. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One something Jewish US? related news. US. Okay. US and something. Jewish one, and is it mostly tragic, or do we have some good ones? Um, it's it's mostly like shocking, you know. Shocking. So not ne inherently tragic, just like oh, girl. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. All right um, can we clap for the first news? Um, this isn't something we like, but let's clap. Okay, because mm, nobody died. Um, first news. First news, Iranian atheist political prisoner Sohail Arabi re-arrested. Guys, if you've been a member of Atheist Republic for a long time, you know who Sohail Arabi is, but let's dive into this. So it's really sad to bring this news back to our community. Atheist Republic has received word that the well-known Iranian atheist and ex-Muslim Sohail Arabi was re-arrested by Islamic Republic security forces from his home on January 2nd, 2023. Sources have informed us that he was so violently beaten during the arrest that he suffered a heart attack. Uh, he was taken to Imam Sajid Hospital and then transferred to the Greater Tehran Prison on January 7th. We have also been informed that he was denied the ability to bring the medication that he needs due to custodial, previous custodial torture um, with him to prison. 
Sohail Arabi is an Iranian blogger and activist who was initially imprisoned in Iran in 2013 and charged with insulting the prophet and spreading propaganda against the regime and sentenced to death. In November of 2021, Sohail was released from prison but sentenced to two years of internal exile. A group of over 40 ex-Muslim, atheist, secularist, and free thought organizations have joined together to politically sponsor Sohail. As Sohail Arabi's political sponsors, we will continue to advocate and mobilize support and solidarity for him and put pressure on the Islamic uh, regime of Iran to free him immediately and unconditionally. Uh, D is saying, but why? We do not have a clear explanation as to why yet. Okay. And here's something you and Mariam Namazi and a lot of other people. So you and Mariam Namazi put this together, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is the yeah, Coalition so for the Political Sponsorship of Sohel Arabi. Hashtag where is Sohel Arabi? And this is the for immediate release. And you managed to get all these organizations, Atheist Republic, Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain, along with all these other organizations, Atheist Ireland, Atheist Refugees. Just look at this. They all signed off to it. That's amazing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Amazing. Okay. Femin, the Freedom from Religion Foundation, Richard Hawkins oh, wow. Foundation. Um, yeah. Bread and Roses, Center of Inquiry, Center for Inquiry, Center for Inquiry Canada. Yeah. yeah Central yeah. Committee of Ex-Muslims in Scandinavia. Ex-Muslims of Toronto. Oh wow, we got Fem Atheist Republic is cooperating with Femin. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This is these are good relationships we're gonna be, be building, you know, for working in the future. Muslim issues here. Wow. Look at this. All of these amazing okay great work great work good job Susie. yeah so this is um and i actually have something else that um you can show so that'd be helpful if you can bring that up i just put in the private chat this is really important you guys so if you're familiar with atheist republic you know that we have been involved with the case of sohail arabi for a very long time in 2019 atheist republic led an international um protest and solidarity for sohail and um due to the international campaigning that he received, his death sentence was commuted. And so one thing that's really important for me to communicate to people is that this is a prime example of how getting together, making noise, advocating for individuals at risk actually does make a difference. According to Wikipedia, wait, I have to pull this up because this actually really surprised me. I didn't know this. Um, because uh, it talks about so hell Arabi and his um his uh, death sentence. Um, in late September 2015, his death sentence was commuted to reading 13 religious books and studying theology for two years by the highest court. According to Wikipedia, it was the first time that such a decision to commute a death sentence had occurred in the Islamic Republic of Iran, where an unknown people are on death row for blasphemy, heresy, and other religious offenses. That's huge. Wow. Impact. Wow. So when wow. I first found out about Sohail's arrest, like this was really, really difficult for me because Sohail is like literally the reason why I do everything that I do. Sohail is what inspired me to get involved with Atheist Republic, period. Hearing about Sohail's case when he was still in prison changed my worldview about so many things. Um, him, his story, what he's been through. Um, what he's been persecuted for, just it um, it really means a lot to me. So to have him be rearrested is um, really difficult. But what we need to focus in on is that our international advocacy and coalition building for Sohail has previously saved his life. And so if we have come together to free him from death row before, we 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 can do everything we can now to help him again. And so what I would like people to do is you can make a post about him on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and use hashtags like hashtag where so hell Arabi, hashtag free so hail, and just also hashtag so hail Arabi. Maybe also hashtag free political prisoners, stuff like this. And it's really important that we get 
eyes on him. Like I said, he just suffered a heart attack because of what the security forces put him through. He's in a fragile mental state. He's being denied the medication that he needs because of everything he's gone through from years in prison before. And so let's make big noise on social media. Um, Mary Namazi and I worked really hard within 48 hours to form this coalition to sponsor Sohail. And we are going to be issuing actions that our communities of all of these member organizations can take to help advocate for Sohail. So please stay tuned. We will be releasing a pre-written letter that you can send to your elected representatives um, very shortly. It's like almost ready to be published. And we're going to be continually coming out with actions that we can all take together as a community to help advocate for Sohail. There's stuff that we're working on behind the scenes. There's a lot of um, information that I know that I can't share publicly, but I just want everyone to know that like we are doing everything we can at this moment. Um, yes, Suha, thank you for showing all the hashtags that you can use. Um, so I want to try as like, this is really difficult for a lot of people um, to you know, have this happen to someone that we care a lot about, someone that a lot of us have had personal communication and interactions with, you know, like for many people, he's actually a friend to us. Like we know him. Um, uh, I want to, I want to try to remain very hopeful about what we can do to advocate for him because we came out really, really strong within less than two days for our support for him. And we're just gonna keep it going week after week after week until, like it says in our statement, we are going to release him until he is free unconditionally and immediately. Um, so if you want to read the full statement that the coalition has released, let me um, put it in the live chat. You can also find it on the Atheist Republic website under press releases, and you should be able to find it um, uh, posted on the website of all of the different member organizations, including CEMB. Um, so here's a link to it in the live chat and um, where we flesh out like what happened to Sohail, where he is, you can see the full list of members and um, our intentions about what we will be doing to help advocate for him, mainly in the form of political sponsorship, because that has been one of the most effective means of protecting at-risk Iranian political prisoners, as we've seen over the past few months. Um, and, um, yeah, it's just full steam ahead. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, this is one of the cases that shows that you guys could actually do something like the idea, because people are like, Oh, what can we do? Well, this is how it is. Well, you guys actually were part of the reason why soil Arabi is alive. Okay. These, um, it's the social media pressure that we did last time literally saved this person's life. So just tweeting about this, sharing this, using the hashtags, uh, sharing the news is your way of not letting this man die. We have seen that it works. Like we have seen many times that it works. And this is one of them. This is one of those cases. By the way, uh, Suze, you designed this, you designed this, didn't you, right? Yes, I did. And I uh, Look, designed another one. It looks looks very good. I mean, I, I like how fast you make these every time we need them because you, um, yeah, I, I think it's like where we have streamlined all of this. And now now every time something like this happens, we're like, we're ready to go. Let's um, just say I haven't gotten a lot of sleep since this news came out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. I've been working hard. Uh, Wait, actually, also, Armin, on this Instagram post, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Oh, so yeah. here you can see the, um, well, actually there've been some people that uh, were added since this was posted, but if you scan this QR code, this will also take you to the full statement on our website. Oh, Suha is saying, yes, I remember all the protests we did to free him. Uh, yes. Yeah. That was, yeah, we did that. And now, yeah. yeah and now he's back in jail. Um, but yeah, again, those protests were helpful because he was on death row and then he got off of death row. Okay. So that and was then out of prison. Yeah, and out of prison. So it he did was have effective. to serve his full seven point half, seven point five year sentence, but he still was off of death row. Like that's huge, you know. Yeah. And so Hale, with his previous history of being a long term political prisoner, because he was released from prison, but he had to serve internal exile. He's not allowed to leave the country. I still consider him a political prisoner. 
um, he's, he's not free to go, right? Um, being a long-term political prisoner, having his history of being extremely critical of the regime, being an open and unrepentant atheist and apostate from Islam, all of these things, and not stopping his activism after he got out of prison either. All of these things make him an extremely at-risk case for not only abuse while he's in custody, but in terms of sentencing and possible charges he could face, it can be very, very severe. Um, so this is why we want to really come out full force right now. And everyone in our audience, every member of Atheist Republic, we can help out with this by making noise and being his voice. Yeah, Brian is also asking again, what is he in jail for? Um, we don't know. At this point, think, we don't know. We just received yeah. word from the people we know in Iran that he was violently assaulted and arrested. The regime agents it's, reportedly like broke into his house, and it's likely th it's likely just things he's writing and saying, because he's not like doing anything other than writing. <laughs> so it's probably just his. It's his. It's very likely his opinion. Okay. Well, I mean, we'll see though. Um, here's, um, here's that, what I was thinking, because last time his punishment changed from one of those punishments was to study theology and write something about it, like study Islam, basically. Yeah. He was sentenced and to reading books on a, this is, a this of is, a couple years. yeah, this is not going to help you the Islamic Republic of Iran because you're basically <laughs> giving him more weaponizing him to come after you stronger you know telling atheists to study islam even more is not going to have the your desired effect <laughs> <laughs> is not going to have this isn't the win out. you think it is <laughs> yeah this is not going to turn out yeah this, he's just going to come out swinging harder <laughs> like, okay i have more information for why your ideology is batshit crazy okay so i don't know yeah yeah atheists knowing more about religion that has always been very helpful to religion amazing Brian is asking, is it a crime to speak about the scientific errors of the Quran in Iran? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, I, well, let me tell you, Brian. Okay. We had um, a tea. Well, actually, let me show. Um, let's see if I could find a teacher, Iran. Um, what should I search for? Uh, prof, uh, what's Blasty, the prophet? Jonah. No, no. Prophet Jonah. Um, yeah. Here, let, let me ask seen a, a case in which there was a teacher that was executed for saying that the prophet Jonah did not actually go inside the body of a whale. Yeah, he didn't even or, say that he's not a Muslim, he didn't even curse out God, he didn't even reject Allah. Like, he just said the idea that the prophet Jonah survived inside the belly of a whale is un like. He he just dismissed it or whatever. They, He's like, yeah, that didn't. He just said that did not happen. That's and he got executed because that's a Quranic verse. So so his name was Mohsen Amir um, Aslani, con, uh, con, uh, convicted of insulting Prophet Jonah and making uh, invocations, innovation, in religion, innovate. Uh, what did I say? Sorry, innovations in religion through interpretations of the Quran. What did I say? That? Uh, yeah, so he said a 37-year-old man oh has been God. executed in Iran after being found guilty of heresy and insulting Prophet Jonah, according to human rights activist Mohsen, uh, Mohsen Amir As um, Aslani was arrested nine years ago for his activities, which the authorities deemed were heretical. He was engaged in um, psychotherapy. psychotherapy, but also led sessions reading the re reading and reciting the Quran and providing his own interpretation of the Islamic book. So this guy was like not attacking Islam. He was not against Islam. He was just giving you his interpretation. And one of his interpretation was like uh, the Prophet Jonah story was a sim. Oh, here. He had interpreted that uh, Jonah's story in the Quran as a symbolic tale. So not like against it, like it was pretty okay. It was a good symbolic tale. Like, you know, like it's not symbolic. That really happened, you know? Off with your head. I mean, not literally, but like. Which is so him. crazy because I don't know, at my Catholic school, like that's what we were taught. We were like, yes, a lot of this stuff is analogy. As a little kid, you're taught, oh yeah, things really were 
on the seventh day, da, da, da. I don't know why they teach that to little kids. And then later, at least in my life, they go, oh, that was actually all analogy, da, da, da. But yeah. Just, just, just so I also add context, okay? This man had a five-year-old, I think five-year-old boy when he was being executed, okay? So, like, they just made your fa- you this, they just made a kid fatherless for just for saying, like, I think, yeah, for like not even not even going after the main figure in the Quran, not in Islam, not even going after Muhammad, Prophet Jonah, Prophet Jonah, and not even insulting the goddamn prophet. It's like I don't think he was swallowed by a fish. I mean, um, I know you guys, uh, Christians say it was a whale. I think Muslims say it was a fish, but I don't know. Maybe it's the other way around. I mean, what fish is big enough to swallow a man whole besides a whale? It's it's religion. They they have <laughs> they have everything. They have they have whale sized fishes in religion. Okay, so I don't know why I don't know why you're trying to make sense of this. Susie. Well, technically, uh, a whale isn't a fish, anyways. What? Anyway, a whale is a mammal. I know. That's why. Okay. That's what I'm saying. It's not a fish. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why we're saying there are two different things. Um, okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> Brian is saying, I wonder if Iran leaders know that Islam is BS. I don't think so. Um, well, depending on who you think is the leader. Yeah. Because a lot of people think it's actually the IRGC, but that's a different discussion. Yeah. All right. Can we can we clap for the next news? Yes, because this is laughable. Laughable. Oh God, we need that. Next news. Next news. Iran's bizarre new plan to enforce mandatory hijab laws. So, guys, if you heard some fake ass news from the New York Times a few weeks ago that Iran has abolished the morality police or that the mandatory hijab law is gone, that was all literal fake news. And, you know, this is their new plan. According to state media reports, Iran is implementing new methods of enforcing the uh, wearing of the hijab in public. Several lawmakers have flouted the move in. in a, after the first attempts to enforce the law more strictly gained tremendous backlash after the death in custody of 22-year-old Masa Amini in September of 2022. In December, Hussein Jalali, a hardliner lawmaker and member of the Cultural Committee of Iran's parliament, announced that the regime plans to inform women who do not wear hijab via SMS, aka via text. Quote, after notifying them, we will enter the warning stage. And last, the bank account of the person who was unveiled may be blocked, the lawmaker added. Ali Khan uh, Mohammadi, the spokesperson of Iran's headquarters for the enjoining, and right, uh, enjoining of right and forbidding of evil, also announced that hijab laws will be implemented, quote, in a more modern framework. On Sunday, January 1st, an unnamed police officer announced a new stage of surveillance that will enforce wearing the hijab in public. The new surveillance is being, quote, rolled out across the country, the officer claimed. An Iranian news agency reported that five business establishments in Kazvin, a province, a city in northwestern Iran, were shut down as, quote, punishment for serving women who were not wearing hijabs. So I thought that this was really interesting for a couple of reasons well armin before i get into that what is your initial reaction all right so for people to understand why what's going on behind the scenes right um the islamic republic of iran is stuck right now between iraq and a hard place okay uh they kind of want to not enforce the hijab anymore they do want that okay but they can't because that would that could be the end of them. They have done the unfortunate thing for them at building the foundations of their entire regime on um, not just Islamic laws, but specifically, especially this Islamic law, hijab. They have made it to this a symbol of everything they stand for. So getting rid of it will can crumble their foundation their foundations one uh, two they are the regime is not as if af- not as afraid as 
the anti-regime people as it is at, uh, from the religion from its very hardcore radical religious supporters okay because they be angry they are really angry um, they are wondering why the regime is not executing more people and why there are so many women now that have com- in iran that have completely taken off their hijab okay and why they're not just being arrested in mass right we even had we even had a story about the regime beating the crap out of a mullah in the streets because the mullah was asking the police why are you not arresting this non hijabi woman and the police came and instead of arresting the woman they beat the, they beat the crap out of the mullah and arrested the mullah and that mullah was hospitalized so that was a bizarre new twist and things well, so that blew yeah. my mind but that's also according to his account of the story yes we have but- questions <laughs> We have questions like, yeah, actually, we have questions. We're not sure. We just, but we, we saw a video of him being arrested. So we know he was arrested by the police. We also saw a video of him in the, in the hospital. So we know he was hospitalized, right? Um, so, but the thing is that religious people were like seeing the, their eyes were red. Like, what is happening? Is this, they were literally asking, I, I, I follow a lot of these religious people, okay, on YouTube and everywhere else, like the pro regime religious people. And they were they were running like this must be the end of times, like everything is upside down now. Um, they, they were like wondering, uh, like they were looking for the signs of end of times. Like, well, like why is our police hit, like arresting the mullah instead of the non hijabi lady, right? But they are angry with their government, and their lack of support for the government is more is more likely to take down the government than the anti regime people, okay? Because the pro-regime religious uh, loons, they are more of the base and the foundations of the government. So if they lose their support, this whole thing will crumble down. Like Because the people who are anti-regime, they are, the regime has already lost them. This is the only remaining base that you need, they, they need to keep, right? Um, so that is why they, even if they want to remove the hijab, they kind of have to like, they, they kind of play a game with the people. They were like, Okay, we're gonna enforce it. Like, okay, maybe we'll stop enforcing the job. And then they see like these religious people go mad. I'm like, okay, we're gonna enforce it a little bit more. We'll see. Like they're just like looking how they're looking at everyone's reactions, trying to figure out what to do. But I think like good way of putting I think, it. They're just testing the waters to see what they can get away with on both sides. Exactly. But here's what I think the actual strategy is. Okay, not mm. that this is something that we should be content with because the the anti regime people don't want the hijab to be removed. They want the government. They just want. They want the whole regime to be removed. Okay, so this is not something that they're going to be. But I think what the regime's strategy is is to do like a, a sign function. Like it's like a um, escalate. You know, a fluctuating up and down enforcement method where the average mean of it is downwards. Right. So if a gentle mm-hmm. downward um, enforcement measure where it's it, where it goes up and down the mean, right? But because it's going up and down, if you look at it closely, you're not going to notice that the average is downward. You have to actually zoom out to be like, oh my God, it's going down. But because it's going like this around, the, uh, you're not going to notice it. So that's what I think is the strategy is. We Which got is super actually sh- very yeah. interesting, Armin. That's huge. Hmm. Because at the beginning of 2022, it was not like that at all. All. President Ibrahim Raisi, as soon as he came into office, he came back hardcore and he was coming back with very stringent enforcement. And we covered a story at the beginning of last year or maybe midway about how there were secret documents that were leaked showing all the measures that the government was going to go to to start enforcing hijab more harshly. And some of what was in that document was talked about in these new measures where they're like, I'm uh, notifying people via text and freezing bank accounts. But that document was like draconian. It went so much farther. They were going to be using Mm -hmm. video surveillance and AI facial recognition to track down people. They were going to start freezing bank accounts of people that merely had people unveiled in their cars, going after any business that doesn't serve people how they want. Like there were... There were so many levels of state interference going on merely over the veil within that document. Like, I can't even list all of it right now. It was so extensive. Um, 
But then, and then we saw in July, you know, mass demonstrations or civil disobedience, I should say, in uh, opposition to hijab and chastity day that the government was trying to push. And like Masi Linajad was like pushing that and supporting that. And then we had the Dessa Masa Amini and everything changed. Like mass adoption of removing the hijab. Like that has never been seen before in the regime's history. And now it's just the new normal. So if you compare like your hypothesis of this like slowly, you know, downward trend, that is the fact that we're now you know, hypothetically going in that direction is a huge difference to where we were at the beginning of last year. It's actually really striking to put it in those terms. Um, <laughs> Dia's saying this is also stupid to the rest of the world. Yeah, I mean, it's also say. stupid to Iranians, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, except, but not to this lady. Let me show, let me demonstrate, like, all of that I'm telling you. I'm just going to show there's a lot of like this. Okay. I, I just wanted to find one example that I think perfectly highlights the tension that now exists between uh, the government and religious people. Okay. So, so then I, have you seen this video? Okay. Watch, okay. Watch this. Okay. So this is a not very happy religious lady who is angry for why there's so many just non-hijabis walking around freely, and she's telling, giving his her complaint to this man, okay, to this official. Hold on. Look. She's saying like, like, why do we have to tolerate all these insults to us, right? Because oh my God. she is basically what she's saying is that we are going and telling women to cover up. Because it's their response, it's their religious. She's not a government official, right? But it is. She sees her as she sees it as her religious duty to when she sees a woman without her job to go tell her to cover up. And apparently, when she does that, they respond by swearing at her, right? <laughs> oh yeah. And, she, <laughs> and she's we, like, we've seen the know, videos. And and she's like, you know how much swearing we have to tolerate? Like basically saying, like, go do your job because I'm tired of people swearing at me. OK, like I as a civilian, I'm enforcing your laws because you're not doing your job. Like, go and do your job. Go and force these women to put a hijab on. Like, how much insults do we have to uh, uh, tolerate? Mind your business. Huh? Yeah. Mind your business. You don't have to worry yeah, about yeah. this. Okay, hold on. Let me see what she's saying. Yeah. <laughs> like of course like you we can't of course we can't just stay silent uh, um in front of all these non-hijabis like of course it is our duty to basically say something so given that we're forced to say something as a civilian it's going to turn into a fight like you you as a, the government who's not enforcing these hijabi rules is causing all these fights between us and non-hijabi because obviously we can't we cannot tolerate that right <laughs> like it will start of course it will start a fight <laughs> okay so this is amazing she says like i go out with my husband and when we see a non-hijabi my husband is like please don't say something please don't the her husband is trying to stop her right he's like don't say anything it's going to start a fight <laughs> right so <laughs> Her religious husband is telling this religious woman to please stop. Don't say anything. It's going to start a fight. Okay. <laughs> oh, shit. The husband says that it starts a fight and I would be forced to beat somebody. This is actually a concern that men have. If you go out and the woman that you're with starts a problem, you're the one whose safety is on the line. 90% of the time. Yeah, no, but the, apparently the husband is like, also has qayrat, right? So mm. apparently if something happens, he's like, oh, now, now I am a man, so I have to now hit somebody. God, <laughs> I don't want to hit some. It's my religious duty now to hit somebody. I wish I did not have. Look what you have made me do, woman. Now I have to <laughs> beat this other woman. You've triggered my qayrat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but she, like the husband is like, 
don't start a fight. I would have to beat somebody if you start a fight. Imagine like how insane all of them are. I thought the husband was the, <laughs> I thought the husband was like now being reasonable, but the husband is like, oh, you're forced to say something. Well, now I am forced to beat somebody. God damn it. <laughs> she's like, it's it's also, she's saying this lady is like, it's not, everything is so weird now. Like, why does this is also bizarre because she's saying the whole lack of enforcement of hijab rules is like very bizarre. <laughs> and like, she's saying, why is like the police, like the morality police just standing and watching this like, the, like they're a piece of wood, like basically like they're not doing anything. <laughs> like it is your duty like the religious police is their duty why are they not like doing anything <laughs> oh my god they're not the other woman behind the camera who's recording this you know what she says she's like there's so many things you could do there's so many limitations that you could force on these non-hijabi women she said you could cut their insurance you could like deny their insurance like cut their insurance services you could deny them interest into banks like woman behind the camera is like why there's so many enforcement methods why are you not doing these things to non-hijabi women like, yeah. like they're not doing anything so i mean okay yeah this is like i just want to show what religious people are demanding off of the government right now in iran yeah um d is like he's he isn't even paying attention to her yeah he does look frustrated the other guy looks like yeah this lady you don't know like they i think a lot of religious a lot of officials are like they don't know that we can't do this like have you not seen the country is breaking apart <laughs> so it's like they i think the regime itself is fighting like that has people within it that is fighting now against each other over this so that's oh 100 percent. i mean we see yeah. it oh my gosh yeah. Yeah. Was there anything else that you wanted to show for this week? Yeah, yes, yes. Um, two things. One is this. Yes, one. okay. I've been waiting to get a translation of this sign because this was going viral. Okay. So um, he's saying, in the honor of the 12 Imam plus two, I think this plus two is Fatima and Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad. So it's basically, it's 14. So in the honor of these 14 holy people, I S-H-I-T 14 times on the Quranic verse, chapter 4, ayah 20, verse 24, right? That allows, so Quran uh, 424 is the Quranic verse that allows you to capture women in war and R-A-P-E them as uh, S-E-X slaves. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm trying to tiptoe around YouTube's guidelines, right? So this is a literally a Quranic verse that tells you that you're allowed to R-A-P-E woman as slaves, okay? Um, and this person, this lady holding a sign saying, I S-H-I-T on this specific Quranic verse 14 times that, that with it, you have R-A-P-E for a 14-year-old girl because the, the regime officials have done that recently and they have the justifications for it in the Quran. So this is that sign. So that's one sign I wanted to show you. Well, not even and, recently. It happens like constantly. Yeah. I The next sign is not funny. It's kind of sad, actually. So I, I don't know if you guys saw there was two recent executions two recent executions in Iran of some of the protesters and some of the people who fought back against the regime, right? Like less than two days ago, within the past 48 hours. Yes. So this lady is holding a sign. Um, it looks like it's in the metro, right? Um, and what the sign says, it's what one of the people who were, so Mohammed Mehdi Karami, who was, who was just recently executed, when he in prison, when he was in prison, when he was on the phone talking to his father, he said something to his father on the phone that now it has become viral. And she is holding what he said on the phone to his father. And the sign says, Alo Baba Salam. He says, Alo Baba, hi. Okay. He says, Baba Hokmaro Dadan. He says, Baba, dad. 
that they, they passed out the sentences. My sentence is execution. Don't tell mom. So that last part also, has gone viral. Uh, people are writing it all over the walls and everywhere. Basically, don't tell mom that I'm being executed. And now he's executed. So just wanted to show you that. Yeah, can you um, bring up the thing I put in the private chat to show, please? Yes. Because I wanted to actually, like, I don't know, it's important to me to put a face to these things for people. Um, so the two protesters who were executed in the past 40 hours were Mohammed Mehdi Karami, who you can see here on the right, and Mohammed Hussein, who's on the left. Um, Mohammed Mehdi Karami, he was 19 or 20 years old, and he was a karate champion, and, or excuse me, 22 years old, and he wanted to go to the Olympics. He was a really prolific athlete, and Mohammed Hussein was known as being like a volunteer coach for his local community and doing sports stuff, helping kids. And he was 39 years old. And they were both executed with, you know, a complete sham trials. Both experienced severe torture during their imprisonment. I literally can't even give you the details on YouTube. It's so bad it it involved metal rods yeah it, it will involve the their torture involved metal rods so anything they confess to is completely you can't rely on any of it like no the whole the, their lawyers one of their one of the people who was trying to be lawyers when he saw them he was like the, the level of torture was insane okay and also that lawyer was trying to be his lawyers because they didn't allow them lawyers. They had government picked lawyers for them that was actually helping the judge rather than defending their defendants. And the, the lawyer, the, the, there's, a, there's a very brave lawyer right now in Iran constantly trying to attempting to come and defend these people and they denied them. The whole court and the court process is like, from the very beginning day of the uh, court proceedings till the execution happening, not even the execution being passed, it takes like 10 days, one week, two weeks. It's insane. Even based on Islamic uh, Republic standards, usually executions takes uh, the course and everything, the appeal and everything takes years. Like you're taking a person's life. You cannot do this. Even if it wasn't torture, even if they didn't torture these people, even if they had access to lawyers, right? You can, you, even with that condition, you couldn't do these in, in two weeks. You can't do this in two weeks. You're taking a person's life. You have to look at the evidence. So, so, you know, even though, even if they, by the way, did the say the things that they say they did, they had every right to this is they were defending they were defending the people against um a, a threat but we don't even know if they did these things because they were tortured and they had no access to lawyers their lawyers i mean i don't believe a word of it essentially yeah why would i why would i why would i believe anything coming out of the state media um yeah. it's yeah really horrific and um, to that end, actually, let me bring it up really quickly. There are um, two other protesters who are now in imminent risk of execution themselves. And so I want to highlight their cases because it's so important to put as big as a spotlight on it that we can all do while we still have a chance. So, um, oh my God, I forgot. Is this going to let me do this? Shoot, my screen settings are messed up on my computer. I'm sorry. Okay, I can't hear this. You so want to send it to me? Yeah. So what we're going to bring up is um, two protesters who we believe, all reports are indicating that they are next in line to be executed. And we know this because when 
individuals are transferred to solitary confinement, that is usually a sign that they're about to be up for execution. And so that would be uh, Mohammed uh, Gobadlu and Mohammed Buranagh. Oh, fuck, the gay messes me up so much. Armin, how would you pronounce that uh, name? Mohammed Gobadlu and Mohammed Burugani. Thank you. Yeah. Burugani or Burugani? One of those two. Yeah, uh, blue, so penny, penny. both of these individuals, there were a series of people who were facing the death penalty, and then there were some that got um, an appeal, which doesn't mean that they're not at risk of still being executed. It just means that their sentence might be re-examined, and then there were some who had their sentences confirmed. And these two individuals had their sentences confirmed, and now they've been moved to solitary confinement, and there is a huge concern that they are going to be executed next. So what everyone can do is, I just put it in the live chat of how you spell their names. If you make posts about this, if you use these hashtags, include their names, this actually does make a difference. This raises awareness. And um, a lot of people are going to say, well, oh, you know, people are just going to be executed anyway. Well, isn't it better to fucking say something while you still have a chance instead of doing nothing and just being like, oh, it's not going to happen anyways. And just doing something because maybe it could help. Why not err on that side? Okay. So just, <laughs> sorry, just please make a post and raise awareness about this. And um, yeah, so the, cause the status of these two individuals is, um, very very at risk right now um so those were the main things i wanted to cover in iran for this week um armin and we have some comments and stuff that i would like to dig into so first of all before the show started today we had a new member i this is like weird spelling of xerxes or i'll just call it xerxes the fourth became a youtube member so thank you xerxes um uh, Killa is asking, what percentage do you think of Iran Iranian society is as religious as the regime and supports the tough laws? Based on the data and statistics that come out, um, Armin, I believe it's 20%, around 20%. Do you want me to go dig it? Uh, uh, dig it out, like figure it out? Uh, well, actually, you're right, actually. No. So here's the thing. Uh, you have to... You, ha you have to separate these things, okay? So religious... Um, it's now a minority, okay? And religious and supporting the regime do not mean the same thing, especially now. It used to be closer, but it's less than before, right? So half the half the population um, has, around half the population, close to half the population, has actually abandoned religion as a whole, which is insane, which is insane. Um, m minority of Iranians are now... Muslim, based on the recent the recent polls, right? Uh, I think only around something around thirty percent uh, could be considered Muslim now. Thirty something, right? If I remember correctly, yeah, it was it was thirty something. I don't know exactly thirty what, but thirty something. It was below um, thirty five percent. Thirty five percent, but the support for the re that doesn't mean all these thirty percent support the regime. The support for the regime. It was below 20%. I don't know exactly how much below 20%. Was it below 20%? It was close to 20%. It was close it was, to 20%. All I remember was that it was around 20%. 20%. But that was, all of this was before Mahsa, before Mahsa's murder. Mahsa's murder has significantly, in a very short amount of time, changed many, many things. I wouldn't be surprised if um, both the support for the regime and people who identify as Muslim, both of these numbers have been reduced since then. I would say dramatically. We have had so many reports of people of like really old women who are now, uh, who wore their hijab all their life, taking off their hijab and locking their Quran in the cabinet and throwing out the, throwing away the key. Like people are reporting things like about their like older mothers and grandmas about things that they, can, they couldn't even imagine, right? We have seen so many people who used to be extremely pro-government and religious at the same time coming like into rooms on Clubhouse and other social and uh, Twitter uh, spaces and everywhere else and talking and we're like, I'm I'm taking a look another look at Islam and I don't look like what I'm reading, 
what I'm learning about my own religion, right? So, and all of this is happening in the past few months, ever since Maso. This is like, a, you know how uh, when ISIS became a thing, a lot of Arabs took another look at their religion and they didn't like what they saw. So I think for a lot of a running, huge wave of apostasy. And ushered in a huge wave of atheism among the among Arabs. And I think this whole Massa thing is I mean, Iran was already in a country where it has mass um, people leaving re- Islam and religion in mass as a whole. But I think this this whole Massa thing just put that thing on steroid and basically now is accelerating that even faster. And it's becoming is, so normalized. Yes. It's become so normalized that I I listen to like government officials talking to people and assuming that they're not Muslim. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> like they're like, yeah, like, <laughs> like they're like, okay, look, this hijab is this and this and this. I understand that you don't believe in Islam. However, this is the rule of the this is the rule of the law. This is the this is the what you have to abide you have to follow the law. You're like you're you're talking to people as the Iranian people, and you're trying to you're trying to explain something to some to them, and you're like, I understand that you don't believe in Islamic law. I do. I believe that these are not your beliefs. I'm like, do you understand that you're admitting to the country that you believe that your audience doesn't believe in Islam? <laughs> It's, it's crazy. <laughs> oh my like God. they know, they know, the government officials know. So there's that. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Numan also gave us a super chat oh, of 100 thank you. rupees. Thank you very much, Numan. He is saying F Islam. Good morning. Good morning to you too, dear Numan. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, very quickly, AM is saying, please shed some light on what happened in Hamline University. We actually did cover this last week, so you can find either the clip of us talking about it on this channel, or you can watch the full show in the live section, live little tab on our channel. The clip, I believe, is called um, American Academic Fired for Showing Image of the Prophet Muhammad, something like that. But we, we covered this last week. Um, I got very pissed off. Um, <laughs> and our wonderful moderator, Suha, is reminding people that if you love what you see here and you like our community and supporting our community and all the work that goes into what we do behind the scenes, you can support us financially. And one of the ways that you can do that is on Patreon. She gave us the link and the link Thank is also so in the much. description. And if you become a patron, not only do you get a special perk when Armin does the Q&As with Secular Rarity, but you also get some sexy, juicy uncensored blasphemous art um so make sure to go check it out we wouldn't be able to do what we do without the support that we receive from our community so please consider uh joining on patreon or another way to donate if you have the ability to but if you cannot afford to do not consider donating okay take care of yourself first anyways let's move to the next news Okay, let me unhighlight. All right, Newman, I'm just controlling the temperature. Newman is asking a question. I just wanted to answer that. Uh, Uh, Armin has to be kept at a very steady (laughs) climate, okay? He's a temperate (laughs) little flower, okay? Uh, (laughs) Sensitive? Yes. All right. There's a threshold of plus or minus five degrees. (laughs) Five degrees? Oh, Celsius? I'm I don't used know how Fahrenheit. Okay, but I'm plus or minus five, that's... Hey. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> In Celsius, that's a huge difference, you're right. <laughs> that's a five? Oh, my God. You're like, oh, he's so delicate. He needs to be plus or f- minus five. Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> going up five or minus, that's like literally going from, like, dying from heat to freezing. All right. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm an American. Uh, <laughs> I can't Can I... It. Can I can I clap for the next news? Yes. Next news. Next news. Sweden's ban on religious schools accused of targeting Muslims. Sweden's government has been criticized for enacting a policy that would seek to halt the establishment of denominational schools in the country, coming under fire for allegedly selectively targeting Muslim schools. 
quote, it is time to ban independent religious schools. The school should not be the place for religious schooling and encourage religious segregation. Neither Christian sects, imams, nor shareholders should govern the school, said Lisa Nabo, the Social Democrats Youth Union chairman. I don't know how to pronounce anything Swedish, just warning. <laughs> um, a Nandulu agency reported that around 20 schools in the country with an Islamic orientation were closed down since 2019, with only three remaining, two of which have filed a lawsuit against the Swedish government. The Islamic Schools Association has also claimed that the policy was motivated mainly by politics and hate against Muslims. Although Muslims criticized the policy, critis, excuse me, Christians also previously expressed their concerns regarding the bill. Frederick uh, Sin Sindenval, a Swedish priest and vice chairman of the Christian Independent Schools Council, described the tone of the proposal as approaching, quote, incitement against ethnic groups and institutionalized bullying. Um, so let's give some background. So in the background, in 2019, the government enacted a policy and this is actually pushed forward by most uh, very strongly by the social democrat party and um it basically is about shutting down religious schools so you're not allowed to create new religious schools and it puts further restrictions on the ones that already exist and this has been you know enacted for you know almost three years now and um of the schools that have been shut down under this policy, I believe 19 of them were Muslim. And that is a huge portion of the country's um, Islamic schools for children. And a lot of people are questioning the ways in which this goes about. Like how did this happen and why these schools are being shut down in particular. And so they're saying, oh, you know, you're purporting supposedly this is supposed to be about religious education in general, but we think you're just targeting us, or we don't believe your reason for shutting down our school is valid. Now, part of what makes this story a little bit difficult to cover is that most of the sources that I have found about this have been from basically religiously oriented news sites. So I found them from um, like Middle East Eye is one and then another from um, a news website that's called the Daily Sabah. So like Jewish oriented. And so they all have a religious angle on the way in that they're covering the story. And it's very biased in their reporting. And so it's when I've been re looking into this, it's a li bit difficult for me to actually determine how much bias is actually occurring. Now, the Swedish government has come forth and completely rejected, like, the claim that they are being, like, bigoted and biased in the schools that they choose to shut down. They're like, we're shutting this down because of financial irregularity or um, because you're not providing the standard of education that we mandate, da, da, da. But one source that I found, um, the Middle East Eye, they said that, um, like, one school, for, okay, here's a quote from the article. Quote, for example, in July 2021, authorities closed down Al-Azhar Al School in Orebro, Orebro, arguing that a board member who had returned from a trip to Syria could be an Islamic State sympathizer and could radicalize the students, even though he had no criminal records. They also shut down like a, a, a preschool because they said that they were going to like radicalize the children and stuff, according to this article. So I don't know. All this to say is like there's something going on here. I'm not 100 percent sure of how bad it actually is. Based on everything I've just told to you, Armin, what is your reaction? Yeah, I think you're, it's very reasonable to not be sure um, about because I want to celebrate this. Like, I like celebrating closing down Islamic schools and Christian schools in favor of getting these kids to engage with the rest of the society. Um, you know, I want Muslim kids and Christian kids and atheists. I mean, technically, there's no such thing. But kids from Muslim parents and kids from Christian parents and kids from atheist parents 
to learn in school side by side. So, um, and not, you know, be educated in an environment where they're also being brainwashed with dogma. Okay. So I wish, I, I, I really like to be able to celebrate this. Okay. But we have to be suspicious about the intentions here. Like, because Sweden has gone far right, if I remember correctly, right? I mean, so, I'm, I just hear a lot about how people are like, oh, Swedish people think that, or outside people think that Swedish people are all just like, or hurt, or hurt, or like, <laughs> like nice and friendly, but there's actually a lot of xenophobia that goes on. Yeah, Based and on also the government recently home. just has gone radically far right like their politics is also going for like their recent elections and stuff so um so i don't know what the intentions are here if this was you know happening somewhere else i would be it would be easier to celebrate again we should the intentions matter like we can't just only look at the what is being done we have to also look at what intentions if there was like i would be more inclined to celebrate this if there was also more christian schools being closed I it sometimes like, um, you know, something that is being portrayed as something with good intentions, something that we support, right? Um, is if it's done being done for the bad for bad reasons, like sometimes, like, oh yeah, get religion out of school, but the actual intention is to make life difficult for Muslims in Sweden. Yeah, if that's the intention, then like I don't support it at all, right? Yeah. Like I want I want these schools to be closed while also making Sweden um, feel more, I mean, I know it's hard to do that, but I would li like to see a way to make Muslim um, Muslims in Sweden feel like this is their country. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like not, yeah. the, not like the government is targeting them, right? Mm -hmm. um, maybe People there's- People in this article that I was reading was saying that like when they're able to, they're gonna take their children to a different country to receive an Islamic education. Yeah, yeah. Which is like so. Good. so a, see, uh -oh. people don't understand what I, th I think. People don't understand what I'm saying. Okay, people are saying. Unfortunately, I agree with Sweden's position. I think you're being very simplistic here. Okay, I would like to see less Islamic schools. Okay, but there are right ways of making that happen, and there are wrong ways of making that happen. Okay. So we don't know exactly what the intentions behind this is, and you hands also don't have the details. You could, people like secularists like us sometimes are fooled by seeing something that is anti-religious and think like, okay, this is progress, but the actual thing that is happening is not anti-religion, is anti-religious people, okay? With the intention of making this country less welcome, less of a uh, good place, you know, less of a welcoming place to live for Muslims. That is the wrong way to go about it, Right. And again, I don't know, maybe this is actually a good policy, but but we don't know. So we have to be suspicious. You cannot just um, support a policy without actually knowing all the details. And so like one and of you don't need to and you don't need to know the details when you don't know the details. All you have to do is like, OK, I'm suspicious. I don't know. Like like what Susie did. She's like, I, we don't know. Right. That's easy to say. Yeah. Yeah, and one thing that, like, one example of a part of the legislation, as I understand it, okay, asterisks, is that, for example, the it's against the legislation or regulations to have gender-segregated schools. And so, like, one of the schools that was closed was closed because they were accused of holding gender-segregated classes for the better part of 22 years, even though that's outlawed yeah. even for religious purposes that's fair that's fair that's like it's fair to close that yeah awesome if it was a single sex school that's different in my mind because it's like designed for single sex versus having a co-ed school but then everything segregated that's i don't think that that's right but um i want to clarify something d our lovely beloved editor is saying i try to eliminate biased reporting i have eliminated whole paragraphs i thought were opinion i hope i'm doing okay d you were doing Amazing. Amazing. Okay, girl, you were doing fantastic. Okay, my love, you're doing great. Mm -hmm. When I was talking about bias and not knowing what to make of things, I was just referring to when I'm doing my own research in addition to what we put on our site. Um, because like I said, all, most of the sourcing that I could find was from religiously oriented news sources. So um, 
it's hard to get like an objective opinion from them. You know what I mean? But everyone say thank you to Dee in the chat because Dee is the best. She works hard for us and it means a lot to me. Um, <laughs> um, it's- um, um, here's, a, here's an, let me give you um, an example of something. Um, it's possible to have a good law, right? That you're like, well, this is a good law. I'm glad they're enforcing it, right? But you could also misuse a good law because you could enforce it selectively, right? For example, yeah. let's say, for example, um, let me make you make it an, um, um, a, 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 just a very simple example. Let's say you have country A, okay, and you criminalize murder, right? And in this country A, you have people, B kind of people, and C kind of people. I'm just giving you a very, very simple example, okay? And you have B kind of people and C kind of people, and C people, you arrest them for this law, okay? But you don't arrest B people for the same law. And I, every time I complain and they, uh, that a C person has been arrested for this law, you're like, well, it's a good law, it's anti-murder, and they're being arrested for murder, so that's good. Isn't that good? I'm like, yeah, that is good. But I think this law is being used selectively to just go against C people. I, you know what I mean? Like, I know it's very simple, but I'm just saying, like, even good laws could be misleading because the execution method is important as well. It's not just the it's not just a lot that matters. Oh, we got we got a super chat. Yeah, so a lot of people were saying thank you to D in the live chat, which I love. It warms my heart. And then Atheist Damon gave us three. Uh, almost four dollars on well, three forty nine. Three and a half. <laughs> okay. Three and a half New Zealand dollars or whatever dollars. you call it, kiwis. Um, <laughs> and she said thanks, D. Mm. We love it. We love the appreciation for our lovely, lovely D. Um, so Armin, are you ready to go to the next news? Because it is. Yes. Wait, this is funny. <laughs> Something I don't remember is saying every law can be used that in that way. You're just being sweetophobic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You okay. got me there. <laughs> oh, we got another super chat. Thank you so much. From Rakshith. Thank you, Rakshith, for the 100 rupees. Saying all theistic belief systems collapse the moment death myths, afterlife, reincarnation, and immortality after death is debunked, let alone the creator. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the 100 rupees super chat. I yeah, concur, that's... Rakshith. <laughs> thank you for the super chat. Thank you. Um, so this next story is juicy. Clappable? It's juicy and clappable. Okay. <laughs> Next news. Next news. Probe reveals or ultra-Orthodox Jewish schools are exploiting special funding. This goes deep. Okay. In New York, the United States of America, a new investigation released by the New York Times revealed that Hasidic and Orthodox schools, Orthodox Jewish schools in New York City are using funds intended for special education for other purposes. The report referred to a 2014 New York City government policy created under a former bill, Mayor Bill de Blasio, which was, made it easier for private school students to receive state-funded special education. But as the Times reported, the policy led to, quote, a windfall of government money for services that were sometimes not needed or even provided. The New York Times also reported that dozens of Hasidic and Orthodox Jewish schools, also known as yeshivas, have urged parents to have their child diagnosed with disabilities. Two yeshivas sent mass emails to parents encouraging families to apply for funding. Another school reportedly gave out sample prescriptions to parents, which they could then give to their children's doctors, allowing them to be diagnosed and receive more government resources for the yeshiva. Unsurprisingly, many Hasidic Jews attacked the New York Times and mounted a media campaign against them, accusing the media of outlet of bigotry and threatening the lives of Hasidic Jews. However, many advocates for yeshiva school reforms welcomed the investigation, saying that they are necessary to force these schools to change. So there is a lot to unpack here. That was the summary. Let me give a little bit more background explainer. So the New York, 
The state of New York has a policy where if your child is in private school or in public school and they need special accommodations because of a disability or special need that they have, the government will basically, this is a very simplified version of this, right? This is Susanna's understanding of these broad government policies. Basically, the government will subsidize your the parents going to an outside provider to get the services that the state could not give to the child. Because according to federal law, the state has a mandate to provide the disability services that children need. If the state cannot do that through public means, basically this policy is like mandating that they subsidize parents going to outside providers to do this. And so in 2014, this system was like so overburdened with requests and they weren't coming through fast enough that Mayor Bill de Blasio at the time basically sped up the whole process. And when this happened, it ushered in a huge change to the system. And this New York Times investigation, with the New York Times last year also did a very deep investigation into how basically children in yesh yeshivas are not receiving adequate education. They're failing at insanely disproportionate rates. Um, they also investigated how these schools, many of them, not all, have a system, according to their reporting, of working around this system to get as much money as possible out of the system and back into the yeshiva. And so to the point that, um, okay, here's a quote from a summary of it. The newspaper also reported that of the 18,000 applications for special ed services filed by the families last year, more than half came from districts with a large Hasidic and Orthodox communities. But however, so if, if more than half of these requests are coming from boroughs that have a disproportionately high population of these particular communities, right? But there is no research indicating that these communities, disabilities occur more frequently within these communities on average, right? We have no empir empirical data to support that. And not only that, but there is a system in which a part of the problem is that one of the reasons why a lot of these children were being referred to special education things is because they are failing English um, testing. But they're failing English testing because as previous reporting has exposed, the yeshivas are not giving these children any secular education. And actually, many of them barely even teach the children English. So of course, when a qualification for special education credits is you know, not being up to par with their peers in terms of English speaking, when you're not being taught English in the school setting, then you suddenly qualify for this. Now, another thing that's happening, according to the New York Times, I read the full report, is that there's this relationship happening where since this ha this change in policy in 2014, there has been ex an explosion in the industry of these special services companies. And the special services com companies often are created by people who do not have a proper background in education in special education for children. And they're sometimes coming from people who basically are come out of degree mills that work within the Hasidic community. And then the third thing is that these companies that offer the special education to students often make large donations to the yeshivas so that then they get referrals. And on top of that, the yeshivas, the, excuse me, the many of the services that are supposed to be offering the special ed to these students are charging much more than the government comparison of those services. And not only are the services charging the government more on average per hour, but then they're paying the person, the teacher to the students, less than a comparable peer offering the same service. So there's like the service provider and then like the teacher. 
So the teacher is being paid less on average, but the service is being is charging the government more on average. And oh my God, there's just like so much more that um, we could get into. And then in response to this, there well, Armin, before I well, go into we, the community's yeah. reaction, like just okay. give me your reaction to all this. No, I don't. No, we I shouldn't because we we need to move on because we're gonna. I'm just going to let you give your reaction because I, I do want to say a lot. Of, I just want to add that, guys, like, look, we are going after um, Jewish nonsense as well okay? because we get accused a lot um, about not covering, you know, um, Jew, Jewish mumbo jumbo here. But we do every time, every time we see it, we do. In fact, we have two Jewish related news today, which is odd. Um, but I just want to add that. I just want to take credit for that fact that we do cover a Jew, Judaism as well. Um, but, but yeah, but we need to move because we have so much more juicy news coming and we need to move on to the next ones. Yeah. Well, I just want to say one more thing. So, what people need to understand is that. This is something that, I mean, there was a very big reaction to this and the ultra-Orthodox, Haredim, Hasidic, whatever you want to call it, community has given a strong reaction and they did a media campaign basically showing that the New York Times has done this many stories talking about our community. And at the same time, we've had this huge explosion in anti-Semitic attacks that have happened. And that is genuinely big problem in the United States. Year over year, the people who get hate crime to the most are Jews. It's just a fact. Yes. yes. It, it's just a fact. And it needs to be addressed in our country and like no one wants to properly address it. However, organizations and people investigating the fact that these children are being purposefully like cut off at the knees for lack of a better term, like restricted from birth to be stuck within this community that doesn't give them a proper secular education, barely teaches them English. So they are, they're essentially chained into these extremely insular communities. It's, and they're the most strict, you know, the most traditional, they're not representative of most Jews in America by far. Um, it's having a concern for those children and having them being raised in an extremely, extremely high control environment like is of concern to everyone that is of concern to the state. What if, if this was happening in any community, right? And so it frustrates me there. I mean, when there were policies trying to be put forth to reform these schools, there were parents outside saying, I would rather holding signs saying, I would rather go to jail than cha change my child's education. So it's, they're very hardcore about this. And having a concern just saying like these children should be afforded the same opportunities as any other community and as a state we're actually mandated by law to ensure that that happens that's not bigotry towards a group and there are there's an amazing okay, organization okay, just go, okay yes this is my last point there's an amazing organization called yafed spelled y-a-f-f-e-d and they are an organization of people who escaped the ultra orthodox community and they are pushing and there's also another one called footsteps and they are pushing to help people who want to have a life outside of this community and pushing to ensure that these children are granted the education that they have a right to as american citizens and these are people who are you know this is this is their community this is what matters to them and to say that like these people are like somehow anti-Semitic, that, that, that is ridiculous. And so I want to highlight their work because I want more people to support their work because it's really important to me. Okay. Two things I want to mention really quickly. One is that um, the, the, the people who are accusing others of anti-Semitic, they are, they're hurting Jewish kids. Okay. The, the people who are raising like awareness about how, abusive these people these orthodox jewish people are being to their own community that is not that's the opposite of anti-semitic okay there's a concern that these people have for how much these orthodox communities are hurting jewish kids this is like this is um in their favor but also how i don't know evil do you have to be to use the actual 
racism against Jewish people as a way to shield yourself from criticism. You know, you're abusing, you're taking the hurting of your community. And instead of trying to reduce it, you're weaponizing it to shield yourself from criticism. I've seen this being done by Christians, you know, like um, I've seen this being done by especially, um, you know, the Muslim community, you know, they call it Islamophobia every time you do that. I see that now Hindus have learned this. A lot of Hindus have been learning that from Muslims. They even have a Hindu phobia term for it, for it now. They throw that around. But now this is like, but it's, I don't know why, but I find it very disgusting when it, when it's being used like this. Um, by Jewish communities because the hurt was so much more significant, right? Like they're even using the hollow, you know what, you, such a major crime in history to use that in your favor to protect yourself, especially when you're making financial gains, especially when people are trying to figure out how to lift up the kids from your community, right? And you use those major crimes in history as a way to be like throw that in people's faces to shut people up, it's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. Anyways, it would be anti-Semitic to deny these children the rights that are afforded to them as American citizens. Yes. Yes. Period. Exactly. Yeah. Good point. Um. Right. These kids are American. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Exactly. I have to have my, you know, Amrika <laughs> moment every now and then. All right. Can we clap for the next news? Um, yeah, this is kind of a general deep dive. All right. Can we uh, spend a little bit less time on each? Well, not a little bit. Can we spend less time on each news so that we could? Oh, yeah. We I are forgot that you have a hard right. stop tonight. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, next news. Next news. Should Jews be worried about the rise of the Black Hebrew Israelites? The Black Hebrew Israelites, a fringe religion, once made once again made its headlines in the United States at the end of 2022. The group is composed of different sects, which essentially agree that African Americans are the direct descendants of the biblical Israelites. In the latest viral video, the group was marching in support of Kyrie Irving, who was returning from an eight-game suspension by the NBA Brooklyn Nets. Irving received his suspension after posting a link to a documentary by Hebrew Israelite, which is perceived as anti-Semitic. The documentary exposes, quote-unquote, that Blacks or African Americans are the true biblical descendants and that the people who call themselves Jew to, Jews today are imposters. Some more extreme sects depict light-skinned people as quote-unquote agents of Satan and are unabashedly homophobic and misogynistic. The Southern Poverty Law Center has identified 144 chapters of the Black Hebrew Israelites on its annual hate group list. According to the director of uh, the Law Center's Intelligence Project, uh, Heidi Burich, Quote, this is a movement that has been growing pretty rapidly in the last three or four years, largely in reaction to Trump and white nationalism. The Black Hebrew Israelites have been have used these developments to recruit into their movement. No reliable polling exists to determine how many members there are, but some sources estimate that there are well over a million Black Hebrew Israelites in the United States. So I wanted, oh my God. So Dee actually brought this news to my attention and she she wrote our summary for this for the website. And she said, I watched the three hour documentary. It was crazy propaganda nonsense. Okay, now I actually want to go watch it. Me too. I've heard about it. It's called, I don't know if I can say this word out loud. It's not a... Spell it. Okay, it's... um, it. And the name of the documentary is From Israelites to N-E-G-R-O... Es. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's not like it, it, you know. It just doesn't sound really? good when I say that word. Okay. <laughs> um, I would prefer not to say that word. Um. So this, I mean, so we actually, Armin, a few years ago, we interviewed a former Black Hebrew Israelite. So you guys can check out that video. It was me, Armin, our former host, Jewish co-host, ex-Jewish co-host, Rivka. And um, 
our friend San Miguel. You can find his YouTube channel at San, San Miguel, Miguel San Miguel TV. And um, this is very interesting to me because I was fascinated with the Black Hebrew Israelites a few years ago, and so it's very striking for me to see them come back into prominence again one because of the Kyrie Irving situation thank you D for giving us the name but redacted oh, Mustafa is saying I'm making popcorn already <laughs> <laughs> um the black Hebrew Israelite ideology has been seeping into pop culture more and more and it's really concerning to me because we've seen how Kanye West has like gone off the deep end that's an understatement and also just to dismiss it as the deep end is a way like i don't know dismissive itself or diminishing it um and but then we also see references to bhi ideology and kendrick lamar's lyrics and you know kanye is saying i can't be anti-semitic because i'm a semite which is like the textbook textbook bhi like slogan they have all these like little clips for different things that people say against them and um they have gotten more attention over the past few years because there's been a few incidents where bhi members have actually gone and done extremist acts of violence and killed many jewish people um and um it's really it's really concerning a few years ago um, when I started to learn about street epistemology, I would go downtown and I would go talk to the Black Hebrew Israelites. And I would stand on the street corner and talk to these guys for hours, just trying to understand what's going on. And I, go ahead. I argued with um, a group of them in LA. It was very intimidating. And what I was what is was bizarre to me is that their insistence like actually i ran into them twice in la okay and two different groups and they were very insist insistent on knowing my ethnic background yes, before they talked to me yes they were like no like no let's talk like they were they were refusing to talk to me because before they understood my ethnic background i'm like why were they so obsessed with that and eventually, I, I when I told that. them, and eventually when I told them, okay, they weren't. This, this was not a back and forth discussion. Okay, they started giving me a lecture about my position in their ideology based on my ethnic background. I told them like, okay, I'm Persian. Okay, and they were like, okay, let me explain to you. And basically, the summary of that was, I will be with their slave at, very soon. Yes. Yeah. 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 That, that like, I will become as a Persian one. I will be. I will be their slave, very and in a very not very distant future. And yeah. So yeah. But yeah. Tell me why. Why are you so obsessed with uh, with my? Ethnicity? So a corner. Okay. Um, in BHI universe, they they're different sects, and the different sects are referred to as camps. So some of the camps have different beliefs that may not apply to the other camps. So I'm just going to talk about the camps that what, what I have heard to the camps that I have interacted with. And what is hilarious is that if you talk, there will be two groups of black Hebrew Israelites on different street corners, like screaming obscenities at passersby. And if you go ask one group, well, what do you think of that other group over there? They will swear that both of them, they're like, no, I'm the true one. They're the fake ones. They're going to go to hell. We're the real ones. Don't listen to those guys. <laughs> um oh wow yeah 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 so there's like there's like tons of in rivalry but the whole reason is that according to their ideology or the ones that i've interacted with um basically the only true people of god are going to be the people that survived the transatlantic slave trade the descendants of those people that is their genesis that's basically their new genesis story isn't it Yes, actually, if you think about like the history and kind of like psychology of a people that were uprooted through slavery and they don't have a history of they lost their personal history and ancestry, in a way, it makes sense that they would latch on to a book that's presented to them and be like, hey, actually, there's a lot of similarities between this story and the Bible and my story. Like, what if this actually was my story? What if this actually explains why my people are persecuted, why we're struggling, da, 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 da. 
But the people that I have interacted with, I swear to God, are the most racist people I have ever talked to in my life. And I'm not just talking about like, oh, they're anti-white racist. They're the most virulent, foaming at the mouth, anti-Jewish people I've ever heard in my life. The stuff that they say, I I would be nuked off of YouTube before I would leave my mouth if I told you guys on YouTube what they say to me, okay? <laughs> YouTube wouldn't even let me get it out of my mouth. But, um, uh, and now, by the way, this, this, this was growing or other black people. Yes, 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 yes. Hardcore. Yes. The stuff they say about black women. I was like, I haven't even heard a white nationalist to say this. This is obscene. Okay. Um, so in one else, this was already a growing movement, but it has now accelerated because of ye or Kanye. It's yay. Which one do we say? Yay or ye? He goes okay. by yay now. Yay? Yee! I like that. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of a name is that? Y E. Why did he pick that name? Well, yeah, because it's just yay is short for Kanye. Oh. Duh. Was it too hot? I didn't know that. I don't follow celebrities, okay? But why? Why is it too hard to say con? Don't ask questions when it comes to oh, Kanye, okay. okay. Just don't like, ask. Oh, Kanye. No. Oh no, so uh, that's so tiring. E e e. Okay, but yay is even more stupid. Like yay. Um, okay, but this man has. Um, single-handedly made because people are people are not interested here the thing okay a lot of us atheists are wrong about how people operate when it comes to their belief system okay because we're like oh this is not true so why believe in it okay well you misunderstand the function the utility that believing in things has for people okay people don't necessarily believe in things because they they want to believe in things that are true. People believe in things because they want to be associated with a group. Okay. That's uh, the belief is a membership card. Okay. So when um, Kanye comes and says that this is amazing, this believes in this and a major, one of the world's greatest celebrities endorses such an ideology and people want to be like, it, it's just, it's now becomes cool to believe in it. So, and again, this is a religion that is more racist than any other religion that I can, I mean, Judaism was already a very racist religion, okay? More racist than Christianity and Islam, okay? But now they have taken one of the most racist religions in the world and they have made it even more racist, okay? But it's and not even, even really approximate to real Judaism. Some of them actually go on to convert to Judaism and that's like not usually kosher so to speak but no, but um, it has it has the foundations to have uh, that ideology of racial supremacy of a cho god choosing people his favorite people based on their ethnicity but most That's of the foundation to the king's james bible above all not all of them but most i understand that but that whole we are the chosen people so we special you be our slaves that comes from judaism okay and it's ironic because they're using that racist religion that to be racist against the people who that religion has picked as the superior people, which is so bizarre. Um, well, they say, you know, one of their, this is the classic black Hebrew Israelite line is they're saying, well, we're not Jewish. We're Israelite. And you're like, well, what about the people that we call Jewish? And they're like, see, this is the trick. The Jew-ish. Right get it and like this is the dumbest thing i've ever heard <laughs> here's the thing let me tell you how similar it is i was only twice told in my life that i will become a slave okay okay one time it was in la the other time it was in jerusalem okay one time was by black hebrew israelites in la the other time was by an orthodox jewish person in israel and the only difference was the the one in israel the by the jewish person the ultra orthodox jewish person he was nice about it he was like 
you're gonna be our slave, but you will like you will be you it would be good. You would like it. You would be it, we will treat you nicely. Don't worry. <laughs> you would be you, you would enjoy you would be it would be so nice. It would be your slavery to us would be even nicer than you have the life they have right now. Okay. But the black Hebrew Israelites, when they told me if they were I was gonna be a slave, they were like, We're gonna you gonna it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be bad. We're gonna oh punish. I mean, I was like, you know, little Susanna downtown. There's like, you know, these huge six foot tall dudes, several hundred pounds, and they're like talking to me. I'm like, yeah. So what's gonna happen when the end of times comes? And they're like, well, you're gonna be our slave, and we are gonna rap you. And then when you have our babies, we're gonna bash their heads against rocks. Just like saying this to me, like in public, and I'm just standing there. I'm like, I'm just talking. I actually didn't feel threatened at all. I'm just like, oh, okay interesting you really believe that huh <laughs> you were being told by these people that they're going to r-a-p-e-u as their s-e-x slave yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, okay amazing yeah 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 and i'm just like yeah. okay cool so i'll see you next week because i still want to talk to you more <laughs> <laughs> wow amazing um yeah dia's why would they been argued with them downtown in my city it's, but why it's would they? Why would they bash the thinking. heads of their own baby? Like they would rape you, so they you will have their babies. So why would they bash the heads of their own babies against the rock? I can't remember. Oh. I can't remember because uh, what's also important to them is the patrilineal heritage. They don't care about matrilineal lineage, which is different than actual Judaism. But um, it, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And if if they're actual biblical scholars, they go through their tenets. They're like, this is. A complete misreading of like all this stuff everything but guys if you're interested in this go check out san miguel tv because he debates black hebrew israelites and he's very well researched and debunks all of their claims and he you know survived that cult they are a legit cult um and he's a friend of the show so go check him out okay so apparently <laughs> throwing on head is saying little susanna merch opportunity <laughs> 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 something I don't remember saying. I have been told that a few times. Yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, it's a very common thing. That's like, yeah, you will be our slave. We will rape you, and you will have our babies and bash their heads against the walls. Yeah, it's just a normal thing to hear every day. What girl well, does On a casual Saturday. That, <laughs> I was literally how I used to go spend my Saturdays because I'm Anyways. a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can we we need to move on. can we clap for the next news? Yes. Right, next news. Next news. Indian Supreme Court rules religious conversion can't be for the purpose of charity. Um can't be the purpose of charity. The Supreme Court of India recently called charity, quote, quote, with the intention of religious conversion, dangerous. There is nothing wrong with charity by religious groups, but the same cannot be said if the purpose behind the, an act is for religious conversion, said the Supreme Court on December 5th. The division bench of Justice M.R. Shah and Justice C.T. Uh, Ravi Kumar approved the petition of the Bar uh, BJP leader Ashvini Up Upadhyay which moved the court against deceitful religious conversion and rejected all kinds of interventions. The matter at hand is, quote, very serious, the bench insisted, while stating how conversion offering food, grains, medicine is wrong and alluring is dangerous. Quote, if you believe that particular persons should be helped, help them. But it can't be for conversion. Allurement is very dangerous. It is a serious issue and is against the basic structure of our constitution. Everyone who stays in India will have to act as per the culture of India, the bench said. Quote, the purpose of charity should not be conversion. Every charity or good work is welcome, but what is required to be considered is the intention. So let me get a little bit of background. There is a petition that this guy put before the Supreme Court where he's asking the central government of India to just basically take more notice to the issue of forced conversions, unlawful conversions, da da da, and basically collect more information about it, take it more seriously, and treat it as a real issue. Now, there are a multitude of states in India that have anti forced conversion laws. Eight in particular are under the realm of religious freedom bills. But the religious freedom bill is actually like 
putting extra steps or extra surveillance on couples in particular, interfaith couples who are getting married. And there was a particular case that came forward in the case of the state of Madhya Pradesh. Um, I pronounced that wrong. And uh, where in that state, it is enforced where you have to give a magistrate at least 30 days notice of your religious conversion before it happens. Otherwise, you and the people who have facilitated it and who are present for it, da, da, da can be prosecuted and fined or even brought to jail. In some cases, these in some states, these cases are non-bailable offenses. So this statement by the Supreme Court came forward when they were discussing about um, forced religious conversion, not in the sense of a interfaith relationship, but in the realm of charity. And um, Armin, like, what is your initial reaction to this? I mean, I've seen so many people be concerned about these mass conversions, especially Christian. This is mostly about the Christian ones, isn't it? Because that is the main one that is happening in India. Um. Well, no, they also freak the f out about love jihad and Islamic conversion. I know, but I know, but the mass conversions done by organizations that is like Christian missionaries in India. They have a major thing. You see so many, so many videos we've seen of like. A, giant groups of people and there's in a Christian gathering and they're all being converted at the same time from Hindus. I don't know if it could be uh, being from Hinduism to Christianity. And a lot of Hindus are seeing this as a threat to the um, demographics of their country. Right. Um, I think like they are overused uh, when they say forced confessions. I don't know how forced it actually is because it looks pretty voluntarily. But people are saying, like, no, they've been brainwashed or they've, like, been giving food or something. I mean, that might make it questionable, but it doesn't make it forced. Um, I mean, I don't know. Is it? I don't know the intentions between, behind this rule. Is it because they're just afraid of people willingly leaving Hinduism and they're trying to preserve the Hindu culture of India? Is that what so, it is? I'm going to treat this news in general with a bit of... Um like grain of salt for lack of a better term because the indian legal situation can get so complicated and i've gotten it wrong before so i'm not going to pretend to act like an authority on this just like fyi so but my understanding is that the guy putting forward this petition is like basically trying to get the government to make it a bigger deal than it already is and the government across many states in india is already making this a very big deal but they're saying no now we need the federal government to get like on board with how serious this is and there have been people who have come forward and tried to um put up uh, opposition to this petition that this guy put forward including a rationalist society from south india so that tells me that there's like a little bit more going on here that meets the eye. And there was an update that happened where basically the, um, my understanding is the higher court ruled that the, um, the way in which the state government was trying to enforce a magistrate to get involved with religious conversions, like wasn't necessarily going to hold, but then another justice came in and said like, no, we're going to hear this again. So there's still more to, go forth but like the central question is kind of like how much does the state belong in the matter of someone's religious conversion and for me personally i think it should go without saying that it shouldn't be at all but this becomes more complicated in india when for example if you're from a, a scheduled caste or backward caste as they're called and you convert to a of christianity you're going to lose the state subsidies that you receive that you previously had when you were acknowledged as a backward caste or whatever within Hinduism. So the state already is involved in that kind of way, just as an example. I mean, and also many different ways, especially marriage laws. And so it gets very complex. But India does have a history of people using religious conversions to incentivize people who are very genuinely needy. And I do find that very, very predatory. And so I can't come out and say like, oh, this is completely off base because this has been something that has historically happened to like a, throughout India's history. It is a predatory practice. Mm. 
Okay, we need to move on. Can we clap for the next news? Um. Oh, this is so wild. Hmm. Yeah, we okay. can clap. I mean, yeah, we, this is just wild. Next news. Next news. Hindu nationalist India MP calls to keep sharpened knives at home. I love some good old Hindutva incitement to violence. I actually don't love it. I hate it. We don't like it. You too? No, yes, that was... We're against this. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That was complete sarcasm. Um, yes. on this is December, bad, YouTube. Okay. This is very bad. On December 25th, uh, Bharatiya Janata Party or BJP Member of Parliament, uh, Pragya Thakur of Madhya Pradesh, um, made controversial remarks on quote-unquote love jihad and also told the Hindu gathering to prepare themselves in case someone attacks them with their quote-unquote weapons. Uh, Thakur spoke about an incident that happened last February when a Bajrang Dal, which is a Hindu nationalist militant organization worker, was stabbed to death by two Muslims. She addressed the crowd saying, quote, keep weapons in your home, at least keep the knives used to cut vegetables sharp. Don't know what situation will arise when. Everyone has the right to self-protection. If someone infiltrates our homes and attacks us, it is our right to respond to them. Just like how we cut vegetables, it will also chop mouths and heads. Pragya Thakur said to the gathering that the Hindus have the right to retaliate against their attackers who hurt their dignity. Quote, love jihad. They, meaning Muslims, have a tradition of jihad. If they get nothing, they will do love jihad. Even if they do love, they do jihad in that. We Hindus love too. We love God. And then the quote goes on a little bit more. On January 7th, over 100 ex-civil servants penned an open letter requesting action in response to her speech. Quote, she is obviously fomenting hatred against non-Hindu communities and advocating violence against them, the letter stated. Okay, that, you know, it's started acting like it's just about self-defense until it started generalizing so many things about Muslims and condemning them as a whole, which sounds more like an end. More mm -hmm. like the whole thing is an incitement to violence, which is absolutely nonsense. Because Armin, so, we are both very pro armed self defense. Yes, that is not something we have a problem with at yeah. all. The, the part that she goes and says, like they they are incapable of loving. Apparently, <laughs> Jesus, Christ. we love. Or if they do love, so, even if they do they, love, they, they still be doing did, jihad. They <laughs> somehow they do. Jesus Christ. This is so like reducing and essentializing the evil in the people that you hate. Like, oh my God, like reducing your the others into something that is even incapable of love. I mean, um we 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 are careful when we say this about people like that, not to generalize that to all Hindus and even not to all Hindutva, okay? But it is people like her, and by people like her, I don't mean all Hindus. And all Hindutva, I'm specifically talking about people who believe what she who said. Who have her mindset. Who have her mindset specifically, okay? Who are anti-love, okay? These are people who go out and um, describe other people's genuine love for each other as love jihad. These are people who go and harass people who, who crash weddings because they don't believe in their unions. These are people who go arrest people for being with the... It, as vigilantes it enforce their own rules on young couples who have found love in each other and telling them that their love is illegitimate because they're not of the same religion. These are people who have went in and abused women and have gotten to force the police to arrest a woman who was pregnant, okay, who was in love with a Muslim man and she was, she, her child died in custody, okay. Her baby died in custody because of this, because of the way that she was treated. In the, all of this, in the name of love, like in the and name they of were crushing love. Before the alleged anti force conversion law, anti love jihad law even was enacted. Right. These are people who are intimidating couples from being with each other by ma making laws that ma makes it necessary to publicly announce that you are together so that you get and your names and addresses be exposed publicly and the fact that this is a Muslim man and this is a Hindu woman so you are you get intimidated because now you're publicly people know that you're going getting together and where you live so they are you're up for you're you're open to harassment 
So in t using law laws as intimidation intimidation tactic from from getting people from Hindus and Muslims not to not to be with each other, and the, the you are anti love. You're crushing other people from lo lovers from being each other from marrying each other, and then you dare say that we love right? No, you destroy other people's love for for each other. You're it's exactly essentially pro segregation in general because there have been many instances where there's just like two people hanging out like one happens to be muslim one happens to be hindu and they get the crap beaten out of them literally just because they're seen in the same place maybe on the same motorcycle da 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 because they're just being friends like they can't even be seen in public together because it becomes a threat to their safety like you're not supposed to be seen with a girl like her yeah they, they, they are the jihadis, okay? They are the anti-love jihad, okay? They are the, they actually doing a jihad against genuine love. So you are the jihadis. You, you these types of Hindutva people, they're the anti-love jihad. Anyways, no need to. Yeah, well, she's known as being like a big extremist, so I wasn't surprised by this at all. But man, it took a turn. Anyways, can we clap for the next news? Um, unfortunately, this is not too happy, but it's not. No one died. Okay. Next news. Next news. Bangladeshi man receives seven years in jail for quote unquote insulting the Prophet Muhammad. On January 3rd, a Bangladeshi man was given a seven year prison sentence for sharing an allegedly blasphemous post on Facebook in 2017. Reportedly, um, what is his full name? Roy. Oh, shoot. I forgot his first name. Oh, Rashkesh. Rashkesh Roy is a Bangladeshi Hindu and an organizing secretary for a Hindu group operating in the Muslim majority country. Aside from the lengthy prison sentence, Roy was given a hefty fine of 100,000 Bangladeshi thakas. Roy was arrested in June of 2017 after uh, Fujuya Ahmed, a Muslim, filed a complaint against him, accusing Roy of insulting the Prophet Muhammad and Islam in his complaint. A screenshot of his Facebook post was widely shared, leading to protests calling for his arrest. Although the court sentenced him based on his guilt being proven by forensic evidence and witness testimony, Rakesh Roy vehemently denied these accusations. He said adversaries framed him by creating fake Facebook accounts in his name and by sharing offensive posts with the public. According to Roy, the quote-unquote blasphemous post was made after he objected to an extremist named Abdul Aziz planning to convert Hindus to Islam. Roy's legal counsel was disappointed with the verdict and said that he would appeal to the higher court. That's crazy. Um, look, um, Dornab Head is saying, how can you insult someone who is dead? Don't insults require two people? I mean, especially when it comes to um, somebody like Muhammad, like he is doing, for, he, according to Muslims, he's in heaven and having sex with as many um, angel versions as he wants to. So I don't, this is not going to affect him. So I don't know why you're upset about it, right? Yeah. But also we, we do have um, a super chat. Oh my goodness, uh, Rakshit yeah. gave us another 100 rupees. Thank you for the super chat. Saying if people worldwide leave Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, the question is which group will be the new common villain and scape group for the Hindutva group? <laughs> yes. Probably the Ambedkarites. Oh, yes. Oh, shit. You're right. You're right. You're right. Right. Yeah, the Ambedkarites. And then also possibly the the people who want to abolish caste, well, which would also be the unbed cards. By the way, if um, this was in Pakistan, this would be a lot worse. Like this is very yeah. progressive by Pakistan. <laughs> seven years, seven only seven years. Pakistan would give you a death sentence, and they would not execute you, but you would have a whole mob against you. And they would have given um, it a long time ago, not yeah. like five years later. Um, so apparently. So some of the information that I found out about this case was from OP India. Okay. We do not like OP India. OP India has, we, we have, Indians are public ourselves. We have been subjected to the um, <laughs> journalism, quote unquote, of OP <laughs> India. So, you know, I don't trust a lot of what they say, but. So for people who don't know uh, what Susanna is saying, OP India came after us, after we had our blasphemous art and everything. 
So they have, yeah. So they have went after us very aggressively, which we have we have a history with them. But yeah, go yeah, ahead. we have a history. <laughs> so a court, but sometimes I like to go look at their angle on things because I it's kind of informative to see what their narrative is, right? Um, and they were saying that this guy was part of a Hindu group that was basically trying to stop a very predatory Islamic group from um, recruiting Hindus and pressuring Hindus to convert to Islam. And this guy was apparently being very strong in opposing them and particularly some leaders that they have in their environment. And in response, according to them, um, they... Uh, or, or according to the victim as well, or the accused, I should say, um, the, these people who didn't like the fact that he was doing activism in support of the local persecuted Hindus and helping them not be pressured into conversion, da, 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 then created an account and framed him for these things. And so that's going to be apparently like the basis of his appeal that his advocate is going to help file for him. And the thing is, when it comes to Bangladesh, this is actually not outside of the picture. At all. Like, in I believe it was 2021, there was massive riots in neighborhoods, Hindu neighborhoods that were burned down because there were some Muslims that planted evidence of a Quran on the foot of a Hindu idol. They planted it there, took a photo and posted that around social media, and then it cited riots against the entire Hindu community. That then were like, my my home, my neighborhood just got burned down. I have nowhere to go. They were like made refugees within their own freaking country. And so, you know, I don't like that source. I don't know what to believe. But the thing is, that's not actually outside of the realm of possibility. All right. Before we go to the next news, you start this and I enjoyed reading it. So you want to you want to read this one? Oh, yeah. This is a very sweet uh, comment. Uh, Hindustani Bao, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, said, hello, I am an atheist rational. Love your stream and your approach towards India with unbiased mindset. Jai Bim. Ah, ah, thank you. Love That's, it. So sweet. That's very sweet. That does. <laughs> that was that was very cute. Thank you. Thank you. So oh, he, he also left another message saying that look at this. Yes, I am a hardcore in bed. Right. That's right. Hell yeah. So are we. Yes. <laughs> I'm looking for more, um, you know, um, bed car supporter kind of YouTube channels, you know, in English, like Ooh. going over. That would like I, I'm waiting for to see and the rise of rational um, English India based YouTube channels going after, um, you know, Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism. So. Yeah. I know there is already a lot in in Hindi, but like I hope there's more in English. I I, yeah. I know there's a few, but I hope there's more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Can we clap that for the so next fun? Week? We need to team up with the on bed cries. Oh my god, that'd be such yes. a good clap, guys! If you have any suggestions about who we should team up with, okay, please comment below um, when the stream is over, because yeah. we need we need to know. Help us help us get linked up. Yes, yes, yes. Jai Bim right. worldwide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can we clap for the next news? Um, it just sounds bad to clap for this. <laughs> okay, we won't. Okay, so we won't clap. All right, next news. Next news: nineteen-year-old NYC machete attack suspect wanted to "quote unquote" carry out jihad. A 19-year-old named Trevor Bickford is accused of assaulting New York City Police Department officers uh, using a machete or machete on New Year's Eve of 2023. So, you know, just last week. Bickford was on the FBI's watch list before the attack and had been previously interviewed by federal agents in Maine after saying that he wanted to travel overseas to help his Taliban Muslim brethren in Afghanistan. If that's not a red flag, I don't know what is. Bickford said that he was willing to die for his religion. During the attack, Bickford pulled out a machete and started attacking the police officers. A criminal complaint reports uh, that the suspect claims during his interview, Bickford told the authorities that he said Allahu Akbar before walking up to the officer and hitting him with the machete. He tried to snatch a gun from an officer but could not get it out of the holster. He was later shot in the shoulder by an officer and taken into custody. 
Bickford has been charged with multiple accounts of attempted murder and assault and has no previous criminal record. The department said that the three injured NYPD officers were hospitalized in stable condition and were later released. Did you hear you about even... this? No, no. I didn't even hear about this until D sent this to me. I was like, what the hell? It's, yeah. It's, yeah. But he sucked, he even sucked at being a jihadi. He couldn't even get one guy. It must feel like a total failure. Like, you, you're not murdered. <laughs> Armin. <laughs> and you didn't even get one guy. You know, you must feel so ashamed. You even suck at being a terrorist. <laughs> so good. <laughs> I don't know if that's helpful feedback, Armin. In fact, no, I, it's definitely no, I'm not. just enjoy, I'm well, I'm just enjoying the fact that he might feel like, God damn it, like I, I'm well, like I am a soldier of Allah, but like, you know, look at look at nothing, <laughs> right? So you're now in jail. Congratulations, and you not you didn't even get the sub up that you think you would get the reward from Allah. You think? Well, you would. doesn't he get the reward for the attempt? No, no, the results matter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he didn't die. That's the main thing. He's he's, oh he's not gonna God. die. Okay, yeah. this comment by Lawless Chemistry did make me laugh. <laughs> he said, <laughs> "I'm from New York City, and I appreciate the guy for bringing a knife to a gunfight." <laughs> <laughs> we don't appreciate it like YouTube. We don't appreciate this. Is we're against this. We're condemning it. Okay, we're just having some. But look at that. Like how friendly he looks. Like he doesn't. Look, you know. Can't judge based on I, like if I looked at that face, I would like this is the last person I think would be involved in something. Well, like so this, this kid is like some nineteen-year-old convert, and mm. he started to freak out his family because he was telling his mom and his grandma that he wanted to go to Afghanistan to go help the Taliban, and so his mom and grandma reportedly reported him to the authorities, and then so he ended up on a watch list, and at some point he decided that he was going to go go enact these things and he reportedly has told um officials or the people interviewing him that he was prepared to die for his religion and he knew that he could be injured or harmed in his attempt to do this but he was at peace with it and um he even traveled on the train so which is ways that which he wouldn't be he, it would be more difficult for authorities to track him and um he reportedly wanted to go attack a government officials because he had this quote that basically said that like they cannot be real Muslims because the United States recognizes and supports the state of Israel. So I think he was referring to like him as an American Muslim cannot be a real Muslim while his government is supporting Israel. That was how I interpreted it. And that was like, okay. his motivation. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, somebody, hmm. somebody, I need to respond to this, okay? Because I said, look at that face. <laughs> Doesn't even look like somebody that could do something like this, okay? Armin. And, and Sergu is calling me out, and I am triggered. I am very triggered. So congratulations, Sergu. I don't get triggered easily, and you have managed to trigger me, okay? Sergu is saying... Is he is wrong, Armin? <laughs> Sergu is saying, is it because he's white, Armin? No, Sergo. It's because he's looking at us, looking at the camera with a, with a smile. He's looking and smiling. He looks friendly. Okay. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. I am. I am upset. I am upset. It's it's not because he's white. That's not the reason why I said that. Okay. But, but That's good so job. Funny. <laughs> um, one thing that I think is really interesting. I remember a few years ago, and I need to go back and find this because I. Notice in America, and this is just like can be completely inaccurate pattern finding, but there was actually a study about if converts in America go on to con commit more violence than people who grew up as Muslim in a Muslim community. And I can't remember the exact findings of that study, but I think they did find that converts in America are more likely to commit acts of violence. Yes. Because, because they take it a lot more seriously. Well, that, but also I think it has to do with oftentimes these people are converting in isolation. So based on what I read about this guy, it seemed like he was kind of like radicalized by videos online. 
versus when you are engaged in a faith community, there will be more people who can advise you to look at a verse one kind of way or interpret it a different way or point to the test sphere and say it's not what you how you read it the first time. Or within a community, if they see someone going in a bad direction, there's ways that the community steps in. There's lots of ways. I, I'm familiar with cases in America in Muslim communities where the Muslim community will step in when they become concerned about someone becoming a safety risk for others. So, but if you're not raised in that environment, you have less of those, um, less, less in your environment to help you like keep the brakes on, so to speak. Does that, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, um, I also don't think it's about converts taking our more radical. They like actively picked this religion and went into it, right? That is has something to do with. It. I remember watching a TV series like, so, so when you're born into it, you're more likely to be like, yeah, of course it's Islam, okay. But if you're like not born into it and you're like, okay, I choose you, I choose this religion, right? That means like there's a lot more eagerness and thought that went into it that would like conviction yeah conviction and everything and this is such a known phenomenon that even isis people make fun of this right what there's a yeah <laughs> what like among them the white converts that are there they laugh at them about how seriously they take islam right um like there this is like th- you should so you should watch a TV series, a British TV series called The State. Have you seen that? The State. It sounds familiar. It's about, yeah, it's a TV series about ISIS, right? And it's really good. I think you should. Oh my! You, if you haven't watched it, you should. Okay. And the ISIS members in that TV series also there's like a white ginger convert among them, and he does everything so. Like in like tries to follow Islam in Islamic practices in so much detail, and these other ISIS people are like looking at him and they're like laughing, right? <laughs> because so there's a part in that that is making this is such a known phenomenon that they they that they even included it in the TV series. So there's that. By the way, did you Dude, mention how that extreme? His... How extreme do you have to be when you're being memed by ISIS? God damn. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Oh my God. Uh, you should um, wait. You mentioned that the mother tipped, uh, reported the reported him to the officials, right? Based on what I so, was reading, yeah. This is you see this happening, you know, more, especially in North America, right? You know, th- and this is because this is one of the reasons you one of the many reasons, other than just being a good hum- human being, that you shouldn't be alienating the Muslim community, okay? Because the best weapon the officials have against radicals within the Islamic community is the Muslim community. Oh, that's a the fact, Mus- and they know it. The people that do this work, they know that. Yes. The Muslim community need to feel like they belong in this country, that they are the citizens of the country, and that the the, the officials are there to protect them. That is not them against the state. It's them with the state against the radicals. You have to give them that feeling because without them helping you, like, look, a mother, a mother is reporting on her, uh, his own child. I mean, I mean, the mother is technically not a Muslim, but still this works with Muslims as well. Was the mother, but the mother was not a Muslim here, but I don't it believe does work. so. Yeah, yeah, but this works. This does work within the Muslim community as well. We do see that a lot more happening. A lot, a lot of radicals were reported. A lot of radicals were reported by their Muslim parents. A lot of radicals were reported by their mosques. Um, so yeah, yeah, but actually that doesn't apply here. But it, it, we, it does happen a lot. The concept it, applies in general. Yeah, yeah, it happens more in places where the community feels closer to the. Um, the the officials then in places where they feel like there's a us versus them mentality unfortunately yeah. in america there's been instances where this has been like really abused no. and yes it, we saw we had a report on that we had we? a report on that and um and it it, it 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 harms the security of the united states a lot because we it's just known by people involved in these kinds of 
measures that this is one of the best ways to help prevent yeah um really dangerous individuals from getting more dangerous um we need to actually see like somebody saying the ginger jihadi was a meme um we need to actually see, conduct a study on what is it with um white converts and the fact that so many of them are ginger like why is that like i don't there understand is a disproportionate amount of ginger converts. converts maybe they're just the ones that get the camera maybe, maybe they're just yeah. the ones that get the camera time to be fair. maybe because gingers are just like white like so you're so white that you're ginger right so you're like look how look how white our white people are they're even ginger that's why they get the camera <laughs> Or maybe they're so extreme because you know they don't have a soul and this is their best chance. No I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Ginger phobia. All and right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is the last news. Um. Yes. Can we clap? Um. Sure. Yeah. Next news. Next news. Survey reveals that the the United States Congress is more religious than most Americans. A new report from the Pew Research Center reveals that the 118th U.S. Congress is more Christian and religious than the general public. The new report says that around 88% of all members of Congress are Christian, compared to only 63% of Americans who identify as such. That includes 75% of Congress members who identify as Protestant and 28% who are Catholic, both higher than the national average. Even though the number of religiously unaffiliated Americans has risen since 2007, only one member of Congress, independent Senator Chris, uh, Kirsten Sinema of Arizona, explicitly stated that she belongs in the unaffiliated category. Another member of Congress, Democratic Representative Jared Huffman, identifies as a humanist. So uh, the report also listed 20 Congress members as having unknown religious affiliation since they did not answer the CQ roll calls query, which served as the primary data source for Pew's analysis. Pew Research Center also said in this report that the U.S. Congress has been, quote unquote, largely untouched by two significant trends in America's religious life. The gradual decades long decline of Americans who identify as Christian and the steady increase of Americans who have no religious affiliation. So before we die, actually, I'm going to go ahead. No, I just think like this is good because um, I know there is a mismatch between the politicians and the people. But eventually it will catch up, right? It's not the distance is going to like, I mean, the people will lead and eventually the, the, the way and I mean, the politicians is still higher relig religiosity in the politicians, but it's still much less than before. So the future is bright because a lot of the, a lot of if not most of most of the problems we have in US politics is because of the religious members of um representatives in politics so i can't imagine how much things can improve once they are out and you know once they actually represent the people more i think it's going to solve a lot of not just u.s problems but the world problems well one thing that struck me when i was reading pew's analysis because i read their full report because i do my reading um is that when it comes to um muslim buddhist Hindu representatives, the amount of representatives that follow these faiths is actually um, essentially representative of what it is in the U.S. population. When it comes to Jewish members of Congress, they have a slight overrepresentation in their um, national, then uh, uh, the national population, but only by like one or two percentage points. But then when it comes to Christian members of Congress, they are vastly overrepresented, whereas for other groups, it's approximate. And I mean, non-religious people, religiously unaffiliated or atheist are so underrepresented, it's laughable. It's laughable. So when I when the report compared it to how, hey, these groups, these other religious groups are actually roughly representative of Congress, but then we are so eft when it comes to our representation like it really stood out to me so much more now i do have to say the fact that we do have two openly atheist members of congress is actually pretty extraordinary like that's still a huge 
that's that's still huge, especially for our country. Well, my country, not your country. So we like have to recognize that. But it just still feels so woeful in comparison to just the Christian hegemony. And there was um a I can't a professor. I can't remember the university. I want to interview him. His name is Phil Zuckerman. And he is involved with secular studies. And he was basically talking about how even if, especially for Democrats, their policy platforms are generally in line with the interests of the secular voters, but they are not going to call themselves openly non-religious for the sake of not alienating the Christians that they could cater to, particularly the Black Protestant segment of the population that the Democrats need as a voting block. And so, I don't know, it just it really sucks how it's still politically so important to be so religious as a public figure when it's not reflective of the population. And Pew has released research saying that Christians are going to be a minority by like 2050. You know? Wow. Can't wait. Yeah. We need, okay. Atheist vote, please vote, go out and vote. Okay. Um, so there's that. I am. Um, do you have anything else about this? Because I, there's a comment. There's a few comments I want to highlight. Um, I will. I mean, we say this all the time, but this is just reflective of like why atheists need to get politically yes. involved because Good. we have more and more we make up more and more of the population but we are so poorly represented in the so-called body politic and that needs mm -hmm. to change that needs to change um so don't let religious people have a monopoly on these things by saying oh well we can't do that because that's what religious people do and we don't want to be like them da, 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 da. no we deserve to seize our piece of the pie the same way that everyone else does Let's have people be reflective of our values and not be crucified or have, you know, po suffer political harms because they're being open about their non-belief. Um, so, yes, that that that's, you know, my grandstanding for the day. Um, but you had something you wanted to uh, say? Yes. Read this one. Um, uh, An Anurag is saying, hi there. I got to know about you from my friend just now i am i, I too am indian a hardcore embed right i can make you a meeting with rational embed right channels oh my god amazing. amazing how can they can't how can they well can't when the stream is done because we're about to end in a few moments you can comment some suggestions in the comment section or what you can do is my instagram is linked in the description and you can message me on instagram fantastic fantastic um, okay, and then here's another comment. <laughs> Annie Mayflower is saying, I'm an atheist in need of good blasphemy. Well, Annie Mayflower, you've come to the home of great blasphemy, okay? <laughs> and you can find this great blasphemy by supporting us on our Patreon, link in the description, where we put out 10 juicy, sexy, blasphemous arts every single month, exclusive to you patrons, Okay. And you also get some perks, like, you know, you get to ask Armin and Secular Rarity questions, special questions during the Q&As every week, and um, you can message us directly, good stuff like that. Um, so please consider, you know, getting on board the Blasphemy Train and supporting us uh, down on Patreon. Yes, yes. We get some really, really juicy, sexy Blasphemous art for our patrons, so yeah, link in the description. We also just got a super chat. Oh, Susie just oh Susie, you're back. We got a super okay. chat. Yeah. Oh my god. Thank you for another super chat, Rakshit. He's saying 77.3% of the world population is either believes in Islam, Christianity, Hinduism, and Buddhism, yet shouts their religion is in danger. Danger, irony of all ironies. <laughs> you know, yeah, they Yep, it'd really be like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, we just got an idea for another blasphemous art. I think I like this one. So the Armin, um, first of all, Susanna is oh. like, 
Um, maybe you should write it down. Yeah, Armin, where is Greek pantheon blasphemy? We do have Greek pantheon. I do blasphemy. have. We have a lot of Greek Greek pantheon goddess, and gods and goddesses, mostly goddesses. Yes, we have like we have guys. We have a lot of Muhammad. We have Fatima. We have Khadija, right? Uh, we have Aisha after she turned eighteen. Uh, we have Mother Mary. We have Jesus. We have the Holy Holy Spirit. All of them involved in a lot of sexual acts. Right. We have a lot of hijabi art. We have mullahs involved. Uh, we have nuns, angels, every, pretty much every Hindu Fili god and goddess you can think of. Uh, Filipino gods, Filipino African gods. African gods and goddesses. Yeah, have we done African yet? I don't think so. Actually, we did. We did. We did. We did. We did. We, we did, did African. Yeah, you're right. We did, we one, did. Yeah, we did Moses and the Pharaoh. We did <laughs> Greek gods. We haven't done Norse mythology. We haven't done. Have we done Thor? We should do Thor. I, we have. We have done Frigg and Freya. Yes, but we haven't done anything with Thor yet. We need the Thor one. We need the Thor so. and Jesus with the hammer and the cross. Let's do. <laughs> they could be involved in something while he's with while he's nailing him to the cross. Oh my god! So, yes, so Thor and Jesus. That's fantastic. Um, we so yeah, but we do also need Prometheus, Prometheus and Hera. I think we should do Prometheus and Hercules. Because I think, like, when he Hercules unchained Prometheus, I think we could have, we could have a romantic, um, something right after the free, right after Prometheus, Hercules and Prometheus. Write that down as well. Yeah, we do Prometheus. <laughs> yes, let's do that. Oh my god. Yeah, I think I like yeah. Okay, cool. That that's it. <laughs> like, no, I am straight. Well, tough. We're gonna do. <laughs> we're gonna do Prometheus. We in our version, Prometheus is going to be gay. <laughs> I mean, no. I sh I was gonna make a joke. I was like, it's Hercules. I don't think. Never mind. I'm not gonna make the joke. I'm not gonna normalize. I'm, I'm gonna tell. Su I'm gonna make that joke to Susanna after we go off because YouTube is not gonna like that. All right, guys. Make sure you like and subscribe and hit the bell notification and leave a comment. Liking the video doesn't cost you anything and it helps grow the channel. So please, please, please like uh, like the video. You could support us financially also on Patreon, on PayPal, or with the YouTube membership. But please do not support us financially if, if you are struggling financially, okay? Only people who are completely, completely stress-free financially should consider doing that. But if you don't want to support us financially, just liking the video is a lot of help. So please go ahead and do that right now. Thank you. And so subscribe. Much. Come check subscribe. us out next week. We do this every week, same time. Yes. Good, juicy stories all the time. All right. Yeah, and also... Uh, the Q&A is happening soon as well, so stay tuned for that as well. All right, guys. Bye. Bye.